Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The New York Times recently reported about Tybee Island, Georgia. It's a tiny island off the coast of Georgia that's accessible only by a very narrow, very low-lying road. Except there are certain times when the road is inaccessible because the seawater has risen and completely covers that road. And Tybee Island is slowly sinking into the sea. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the report went on, is spending millions of dollars fixing roads and drains and sending out trucks to suck up the sea salt that remains when the seawater recedes. Norfolk, Virginia has vertical rulers planted by low-lying roads so that if there's flooding, cars can see if they can even make it through to the other side. And Miami Beach, perhaps the front lines of all of this, is spending $400 million to raise streets, install pumps, and elevate seawalls. These, in addition to many other stories, are the front lines of climate change. The effects of a warming planet are no longer theoretical. They are real. And they are no longer in the future. They are now. They are present. Scientists, as many of you know, being in the scientific community, have warned for decades of melting ice, expanding ocean temperatures, uh, and the actual expansion of water, and global weirding of local weather patterns. It's not that it gets equally hot everywhere all the time. The hots get hotter, the colds get colder, the wets get wetter, flooding recently in Louisiana and other places. And as we know personally here in California, the dries get a lot drier. We're in the sixth year now of a drought with super fires that happen regularly. Firefighters say that what was an anomaly in years past is now the norm. Virtually everything scientists have predicted about a warming planet has been validated by evidence and by experience which is why it is all the more baffling that there are still political leaders in Washington and in our state capital, capitals that deny the existence of global warming and sabotage bills even from the military to adapt to changing conditions like seawater rise. Now, many of you who are part of the scientific community already know, and you've certainly heard me say, that humans contribute to global warming by emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, primarily through the burning of fossil fuels, but in other ways as well. And our whole political and economic system, unfortunately, is set up to enable this sin against creation. And as people of faith, we must, we must speak out about this problem that we face even if we are caught up in it, which we no doubt are. We must speak the truth. This is not an issue of what party you belong to politically, what political ideology you support. Rather, it is an ethical and moral imperative to act on this for the sake of future generations and for the sake of those other species with whom we share this planet. We must contribute to the Earth's greening and to the health and well-being of the planet's many and varied communities, human and non-human. Today, as a congregation, we begin the narrative lectionary, a journey through the Bible where we highlight the great stories of God's people and the God of grace that's behind them and the adverse circumstances in which they find hope for the future. We heard from Genesis 2 and 3 portions of the story of creation. It's the second creation narrative um, from the, the one that we heard a few weeks ago, the seven-day creation narrative from Genesis 1. It's a story of creation, but it's also a story of fall, that something has gone wrong. The traditional understanding of this story, as theologians have written throughout the centuries, is that human beings have made an error in judgment. They've stepped over a boundary that was placed by God, 
uh, uh, for them, and as it has led to a universal condition known as sin, a cosmic condition of fallenness and brokenness. There is another way of thinking about fall, however, and that is as alienation or estrangement. That we are alienated from ourselves. We are alienated from other people, like drivers on the road, or people in our lives that give us grief. We are alienated from God, most importantly, and we're alienated from creation. And all of this manifests itself in all sorts of unhelpful and awful ways in our lives. I told you about the jury service that I had a few weeks ago. I couldn't talk about it because we hadn't deliberated yet. We did the next day. It was a drug-related case with two defendants, a man and a woman, who both were playing themselves off one another. The one accused the other one of lying and so forth. And it was our job to decide which one was lying with a lot of very small puzzle pieces. And as I mentioned before, it was kind of irritating that I and the other 11 jurors had to waste our time to decide why these people couldn't figure out their problems, couldn't have made the bad choices they made, and had to, that we had to decide who was lying and telling the truth. A mark of human sin and brokenness. I couldn't help but ask the question, though, as I'm sitting there, who failed these people that they made the choices that they did? But they walked down this path, and they ended up with methamphetamine in their trunk, arrested by a police officer. Today, we observe the 15th anniversary of a grave day in our nation's history. If that isn't a mark of human sin and error and folly, I don't know what is. And of course, in little ways in our lives, we experience uh, being cut off on the road or having issues that drive us nuts in interpersonal relationships. So that what we see in the story of the Garden of Eden is not necessarily an historical account of two people who live in a certain time and place, but it's the most true account that I know of to explain what's wrong with us, which is kind of at the core of all religious faith traditions. We know that something is not right. And we need to explain and understand what that is, why that is, and how we can be part of the solution. Something's wrong, and it needs to be fixed. And in a sense, that's kind of what religion is all about. But this story from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, reflects to us at our core is that sense that we know deep in our being that something is askew, amiss. Yet at the same time, it gives us a sense of what should be, or what ought to be, what couldn't have been. If it's true that we know that we are sinful and imperfect, as our faith tradition teaches us, and common sense as well, to err is human after all, right? Then it's also true that we have a sense of goodness, and even innocence deep within us, that we are capable of doing good that we should be connected with our Creator, with one another, and with the Earth. Perhaps this story of the Garden of Eden is not just a story of human folly, of human beings making a mistake. No doubt you read it from a human perspective, because we're human, and it was probably written from a human perspective. But as Holy Scripture, I believe God is trying to tell us something about the non-human, what if we look at this story from the perspective, not of the humans, or uh, uh, the humans alone, but of the trees, and of the animals, and the plants that are created in that creation narrative? The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What might their experience have been in this story? Now, of course, they don't have sentient experience like you and me, but if we can think from their perspective, it might give us a new angle on what God is doing and what's wrong in the world. Could it be that these trees, who were also connected to the humans and to their creator until something happened, that, that maybe that's what the story is about. That humans took what wasn't theirs, it disrupted the sacred order put in place by God, and now the tree suffers because of human folly and is caught up in a destiny of 
fallenness and brokenness. Adam and Eve, who obviously represent humankind in the story, Adam, earth creature, and Eve was a representation of, of the woman, were placed in the garden to till and keep it. Although many biblical scholars believe that those words are better translated, not till and keep, but protect and serve. The fruit of the garden is for their use and enjoyment, although some of it is off limits. And yet there is a sacred trust that God places in their hands that has to do with responsible use, otherwise known as stewardship. That's right, stewardship is not just about money. It's about how we manage all the gifts that God has given us. The garden is theirs to manage, but they must manage it with care and concern for the other plants and animals in which they find themselves. Now think in terms of the planet on which we live. And I want to suggest to you that the Garden of Eden is the planet Earth. The only place we know of in the universe capable of sustaining life. Green with life, blue with water. This is our Garden of Eden, and the Creator has placed us here in part to protect it and to serve it, to have respect and esteem for the other creatures who live here, plants, animals, and even that which is not living. Climate change or global warming, the acidification of the ocean, the melting of polar ice caps, the record decline of species, the erosion of topsoil, the deforestation of the Amazon, the toxic sludge that ends up in communities that are disadvantaged, that are largely people of color who are poor. I could go on for several pages, but these are markers of our collective failure to protect and serve the garden planet on which God has placed us. And they are grave sins, sins against God's creation. As Pope Francis has pointed out in his encyclical just this past year, we have done great damage to the planet. And we have thereby done great damage to ourselves, especially to the poor in our midst, to future generations, our children, and their children, and their children. What kind of a planet are they going to inherit? And to the other creatures that God has created and loves. I realize this is a difficult issue. Because we usually think of sin as, I do something to hurt you, or you do something to hurt me, and we need to forgive each other and find a way forward. This is a collective sin as a species, and it perhaps is more a sin of omission, what we have not done, than a sin of commission, something we've done to hurt someone else. So we have to think in different ways about what sin is. And yet, nonetheless, it is a sin that we must confess and stand before God, our fellow human beings, and the whole creation in humble silence. And yet, we do this as people of hope, not in gloom and doom, as I hear too, way too many of my friends in the environmental community say. They are, some of them, not all, riddled with despair and darkness and uncertainty about the future. We know something different as God's people. Our faith tells us that the world can be different than it is, and that it calls us to be part of making it different. Some of the folks in this congregation alone have helped with the work of California Interfaith Power and Light to advocate for different laws so that God's creation can be protected. SB 32, for example, is just signed here in California. And that, that took some politicking to make it happen, but people of faith were there. The narrative lectionary which begins today for us tells stories of God's people who find hope in God and God's grace, even in the midst of incredibly adverse circumstances. So we are not alone in looking to the future with uncertainty, with dread. And 
unsure of what will happen. As we read throughout the Bible, God's people face this regularly. And they find a way to muddle through. Knowing that they trust in God to provide them a different future from that which they dread. In facing the gravity of climate change and the other great issues that face us today, it's certainly not the only one, we can at least take solace in this. We are not alone. We are not alone. And on this 15th anniversary of September 11th, a day for those of us who are of the right age, we will never forget. As a previous generation, you could tell you exactly where they were when John F. Kennedy was shot. I could tell you exactly where I was when I found out about 9-11. Glued to the TV all day. This is a great tragedy from which we are still recovering. And so today, as Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, God's Work Our Hands Sunday, we honor those, the hundreds of people, the firefighters and the police and others, who gave their lives to try to save those who were in peril. Nearly 3,000 Americans lost their lives that day. And so we, we give back to those who serve us and say thank you for the work they do. It seems to me that one solution to global human strife, which is at an all-time high, is to remember what we have in common. And that is the Earth, the planet itself. Every major faith tradition has a provision for caring for the, for the Earth, for being good stewards of our planet and our environment. It is a sacred trust for all people of faith and all people of goodwill. And it seems to me that if we could focus on that, perhaps we would know true peace.